So the desired learning outcomes, by the end of the presentation, I hope you'll be able to uh, describe the uh, estimated prevalence of Parkinson's disease in residential care centers, to be able to list uh, many of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, uh, to provide a, a bit of a systematic approach for evaluating patients with Parkinson's disease in the residential care setting. Uh, and um, I'm going to embed some question and answers as we go along, but if something doesn't make sense, if you have a question, just speak up and, and ask. Um, I, I don't want this to be too, um, too uh, stuffy. Uh, and I have to say I'm impressed. Uh, when I came to Victoria a few years ago, I was told, you know, it's not academic. Nobody, uh, you know, people just, just want to do their job and go home. And uh, I learned very quickly that that's just a, was a total uh, false characterization of the medical community here. And I'm impressed with how many people will come out in an evening rather than spend time at home with their families to, to further their knowledge. So thanks all for being here. Um, so we don't really have good Canadian data that I'm aware of or that I could find easily. Uh, and, so, and, and because our systems are a little bit different, the numbers may be a little bit different in Canada. But these numbers are actually quite shocking. It's estimated that a quarter of all patients in the U.S. who have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease reside in residential care. Uh, and of that uh, quarter of, of the patients with Parkinson's disease, only a third of them still have any contact with an outpatient neurologist. So the bulk of their management is done by general practitioners once they reach uh, residential care. Um, if uh, you have Parkinson's disease, and then clearly if you have dementia or hip fracture, that's a predisposing factor to, to residential care. That's not... Oh, we lost our slides here, right? Eh? Hmm. What if I log out and in again? Touched awake here. Anyway, I'll, I'll keep talking while, uh, while you try to sort it out. Room screens, that's the problem. None should be lectern PC. There we go. I don't know how it became none. And uh, that's part. Yeah, so we're back on track. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, now I know that if I can't see it there, you can't see it up there. So that's a big trick. Um, if you look at the, the stats the other way around and you look at all of the patients who are in residential care, up to 10% of them may have Parkinson's disease. So. Uh, at least if we're going on the U.S. stats, this isn't a once-in-a-blue-moon type of diagnosis that you encounter. There, there's probably several patients uh, in your practice that you encounter. Um, so today is not a talk on pathophysiology, um, but just so we're all on the, on the same page, Parkinson's disease is a, is a neurodegenerative uh, illness. But I, I put Parkinson diseases because this is probably a syndrome that's a final common pathway of multiple types of insults. All of them have at their common core the uh, possibility of uh, neuronal injury. This is a very um, busy slide, but it illustrates a point. These are all the genetic mutations that are known to cause the familial forms of Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that they affect many different parts of the cellular uh, apparatus, and, and especially protein synthesis and, and, and uh, proteolysis. Um, so something goes wrong in protein synthesis and proteolysis. It has something to do with this protein called alpha-synuclein that accumulates in Lewy, body, uh, in, in Lewy bodies, but you can have multiple different insults to the cell that all lead to the phenotype of, of Parkinson's disease. The hallmarks are this accumulation of these, these, these uh, specific pathological inclusions called Lewy bodies, and the traditional motor symptoms that James Parkinson wrote about in the 19th century have to do with Lewy bodies accumulating in dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra portion of the brainstem. So we, we, we associate Parkinson's disease with dopamine uh, because the neurons that are affected that cause the motor symptoms are, are in the brainstem. Um, but the disease is much more widespread in the brain. What are the symptoms of Parkinson's disease? Well, when I went to medical school, these were the symptoms of Parkinson's disease that I learned about. Tremor, rigidity, akinesia, or slowness of movements, changes in gait, falls, difficulties with speech. When I went to residency, I learned about a number of other symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Sleep disturbances, including REM behavior disorder, changes in, in smell, changes in vision, constipation, excessive daytime somnolence, dysphagia, autonomic dysfunction, pain, and appetite and weight changes. And uh, when I did my fellowship, I learned that there's a whole bunch of other <laughs> symptoms of, of Parkinson's disease, cognitive dysfunction, uh, 
dementia, hallucinations, anxiety, depression, apathy, delusions, and impulse control disorder. So I think if you understand Parkinson's disease, you understand a lot about the nervous system because it's really a, a nervous system-wide neurodegenerative disorder. It's not just the tremor. It's not just the, the gait impairment. Um, in fact, some of the symptoms predate the classical symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And if you look at epidemiological studies, you can find that patients quite reliably complain of constipation as their initial symptom that predates the onset of motor symptoms. REM behavior disorder, just as a show of hands, who knows what REM behavior disorder is? REM sleep behavior disorder. So not many people, few people are familiar. So this is a, this is a, a syndrome where you lose the normal paralysis that occurs in sleep. While you're dreaming at the, the, the deepest level of sleep, which is called REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, uh, you're supposed to be completely paralyzed. And you're having dreams and, you know, you're chasing dragons and, and uh, falling off cliffs and whatever you're doing. People with REM behavior disorder actually start to chase dragons and fall off cliffs. So it can be quite, quite distressing. Uh, if you don't ask about it, of course, you never hear about it because no patient ever thinks that it's related to the reason that they're there seeing you for, for shaking. But when you ask about it, you can quite consistently find uh, REM behavior disorder predating the, the onset of Parkinson's by, by 7 to 10 years in many patients. Early symptoms are, are the classical symptoms of slowness of movement, rigidity, and tremor, not in equal proportions in every patient. And in fact, some patients have very little tremor, some patients have very severe, and vice versa. Um, pain, fatigue can, can show up early, mild cognitive impairment. And as the disease progresses, some of the other symptoms that I put on the slide earlier become more and more apparent. And of course, by the time patients are in residential care, they're often later on in their illness trajectory, and so they're often having more of these kinds of symptoms that you're dealing with. The reason that we have uh, uh, this kind of progression of symptoms, and you have to recognize that this is really an average, this is a composite of what happens to people. The individual trajectory of, of patients varies very widely from patient to patient. But on average, again, when you do autopsy studies and you uh, can uh, do autopsies on the brains of several hundreds of patients who are at all stages of their illness, you find that early on in the illness, the um, Lewy bodies and the, and the neurodegeneration is concentrated in the olfactory system and in the brainstem. And so that's why you have loss of smell and uh, this REM behavior disorder, which is uh, due to some brainstem pathology, as the preclinical sort of symptoms of Parkinson's disease. In early disease, which is moderately advanced pathological disease, the disease in the brainstem is well established, and that substantia nigra that I referred to earlier is affected, and that causes the classical motor symptoms of the disease. And as the disease spreads, the um, uh, Lewy bodies and, and the neurodegeneration accumulates in areas of the cortex and causes a lot of the cortical symptoms, such as dementia and hallucinations, and uh, et cetera. But again, Parkinson's disease is a highly protean illness. So some patients complain mainly of motor symptoms that are successfully treated for years and progress relatively slowly. Other patients have early and debilitating non-motor symptoms, including possibility of early and debilitating psychiatric symptoms. And there's a whole spectrum in between those two uh, opposites that I'm describing. So let's take a little break here. Um, just blurt out, uh, either in Duncan or 160 or here, some of the challenges that you have treating motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease in a residential care setting. No one's had any challenges. <laughs> Go home. <laughs> Falls, okay. Yeah. Dyskinesias, okay. Pain, dystonia, impulse control features, difficulties in judgment and insight as well accompanying that. And the impulse control is an interesting one because sometimes it can be with insight and without insight. Hallucinations, yeah. Falls again. Falls are a big one, yeah. Falls, falls are pretty dramatic. Falls are an all or none event, so you, you, you catch those pretty, pretty clearly. So 
when your patients come to residential care with Parkinson's disease, unless you're making the diagnosis in the long-term care facility, which sometimes you may be doing, they will often come on treatment. And the mainstay of treatment that you'll be aware of is levodopa, which is usually combined with a levodopa blocking agent in the periphery, either carbidopa or benserazide. So this is the mainstay of treatment. This has been around since the 60s, and it's still the most effective treatment. But patients may also come on, in, in on dopamine agonists, uh, and the ones we, we tend to use are pramipexol, ropinirol, and the retigotine patch. Uh, bromocryptine still exists, and some of you may remember it more fondly. It's, it's rarely used due to adverse effects, although perversely, special authority still wants you to have failed bromocryptine before you, they'll cover one of the other... Um, dopamine agonists, even though the newer ones are now cheaper than bromocryptine, so go figure. So you may see, still see patients who can't afford a newer one who are on bromocryptine. And then MAOB inhibitors, uh, usually resagiline or selegiline are the, are the medications that patients will come in. Uh, COMT inhibitors or entacapone and anticholinergics, and finally amantadine. So this is the mainstay of drugs that are used to treat motor symptoms. So if you're not familiar with the names of any of these drugs... Um, then, you know, be aware that when you see that in the patient with Parkinson's, this is a medication being used to treat their, their motor symptoms. Um, when you see a patient who has uh, non-motor comorbidities, hallucinations, agitation, impulse control disorder, etc., very often there is a thought, and it's often a good thought, that maybe the medications are contributing to this. Maybe they've reached a point in their illness where there is just no real therapeutic window anymore and they're getting side effects from having too much dopaminergic medication on board uh, and we need to reduce some of their, their um, uh, motor symptoms. And so it, this is true. Um, the symptoms that are particularly aggravated by dopaminergic medications are orthostatic hypotension, psychosis, especially hallucinations, and confusion. So when you have your patient who's there and they're hallucinating quite regularly, and they're on large doses of levodopa or they're on any of the other medications I just mentioned on the previous slide, then think that maybe this is iatrogenic to a certain degree. So the principle of the treatment there is you want to start reducing their medications, but you want to do it as little as possible so that you don't compromise their motor function. Because remember, we talked about falls early on, and we talked about um, dystonia, which is often from under underdosing levodopa. So you want to go slow, and you want to reassess frequently. So the thing to do is not say stop levodopa or you know cut it by 50%, but start one pill at a time. And it's a bit of a pain, but dealing with the fall and the fracture is also a bit of a pain. So I would say you know this is this is worth your your investment in time here. Um, when you reduce medications. Uh, I, I said on a couple slides ago that levodopa, which is the oldest drug, is still probably the most effective in terms of you know, effect on motor symptoms per unit of drug. So likely you're going to want to look at all the accoutrements to the levodopa before you start reducing the levodopa. So dopamine agonists are often prescribed, and they're used to minimize the levodopa-related fluctuations or to augment the levodopa therapy. But again, generally, they're less effective than levodopa. So if you're going to start cutting down, my advice is start by cutting down the dopamine agonist before you cut down the levodopa. If patients are on anticholinergics, and very few neurologists would prescribe an anticholinergic anymore to treat Parkinsonian symptoms, but there are still patients out there who are on trihexaphenidyl or, or, or medications like that, that would definitely be the first place to look uh, because they can worsen cognitive impairment. The flip side is most patients in 2018 who are still on medications like that, somebody's tried to cut that out several times. Their tremor got really bad, and they punched the doctor in the face and said, put me back on my Artane, right? So, so you are going to worsen their, their, their symptoms if they're still on it. But um, the, 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 the anticholinergics that were used to treat Parkinsonian symptoms really are strongly anticholinergic, and they can certainly confuse you. Amantadine is also a drug that's often used when patients are developing dyskinesias because amantadine can treat tremor without dyskinesia. It can actually reduce dyskinesias as well. Um, but it, it, is, uh, it does worsen confusion, and so this would be also a place to start in your patient who's confused or psychotic. Uh, so cut down the amantadine, cut down the anticholinergic, start reducing the dopamine agonists, and do all of that before you go to the levodopa. 
So we talked a little bit about motor fluctuations um, rather than motor symptoms. So, uh, so Ian mentioned the word dyskinesia. Is anyone aware of any other kind of motor fluctuation that exists in Parkinson's? Okay. Well then. <laughs> Freezing, yeah, absolutely. I didn't hear that. Dysphagia? Yeah, so dysphagia is a symptom, but it's not considered one of the motor fluctuations. But freezing certainly is. So the ones we talk about are wearing off. So these are patients who are doing okay. They're walking around the unit, and then an hour later you come back, and they're sitting there in their chair, and they're trembling away, and they can't do anything. So that's called wearing off. And wearing off can happen in two ways. It can be end-of-dose wearing off or it can be an unpredictable wearing off that happens suddenly, or sometimes what's called a missed dose phenomenon, where they, you know, they were doing fine in the morning, and then they get their 10 o'clock dose, and it's as if they got no medication in them. That dose just doesn't hit them. Um, so when it's end of dose wearing off, that's actually easy to fix. You can give them more frequent dosing. So if they're wearing off after two hours, well, then start giving them the medication every two hours. You can add drugs that lengthen the effect of the uh, levodopa, for example, an, an MAOB inhibitor such as risagiline. But risagiline being an MAO inhibitor has all of the stuff that comes along with MAO inhibitors in terms of drug-drug interactions. Or a COMT inhibitor, the one we have in Canada is called entacapone. And often you actually need to reduce your dose of levodopa when you add a COMT inhibitor because it can, uh, it can cause worsening side effects and, and uh, diarrhea. When you have this uh, missed dose phenomenon or the unpredictable wearing offs, that can be challenging. Sometimes it can be due to protein interactions with levodopa. So the first step is to try to time the administration of medication away from meals so that they're not having uh, protein in their meal uh, interfere with their, uh, their drug. And you can sometimes uh, just prescribe a rescue dose of levodopa. So if you have those patients who are having the occasional sudden wearing off or unpredictable wearing off, then have uh, you know, the, the, the staff being able to give them that extra pill. If the patient is still cognitively intact and, and you, know, you have the, the permission to do it, then you can even get, get the patient to, to have the pill in the pocket strategy and take their own pill. If you crush the pill and give it with something fizzy, that will ensure that it gets absorbed right away. So you can give them a, a pill of 100 milligrams of levodopa right away and it can unfreeze them. There's an expensive drug in the, in the U.S. called apomorphine, apomorphone. I think we've actually got it in Canada now, which actually comes as an injector like an EpiPen. And, and if somebody has a very, very severe freezing, you can kind of inject them in the thigh. And, and, uh, but cost makes it fairly prohibitive. Freezing we talked about. So, so freezing usually refers to freezing of gait. So patients are walking along, and then bang, they're stuck. They can't take yet another foot. And freezing is obviously a very high risk for falls. Um, so again, rescue doses can sometimes be helpful for, for freezing, but it's more important to identify the symptom of freezing and then have a clear nursing plan if that patient is known to, to freeze. You know, these are the patients who you want to say, just make sure you do take your walker with you even if, even if you feel you don't want to. And if, you know, if they're on a unit where there, where there's, where there is uh, quite a bit of nursing staff around, you want to have it known that if you know, Mr. Jones is stuck there frozen, bring a chair, let him sit down, and, and, and be careful. Dyskinesia. So dyskinesia refers to involuntary twisting, writhing movements that normally you see in the limbs and the, and the head. Um, dyskinesias are a symptom of too much levodopa in your system. But as your disease progresses, again, the therapeutic window narrows down. And so there are some patients with Parkinson's disease who they're either off or they're having dyskinesias and there's nowhere in between. If the dyskinesias are unpredictable, um, then what you want to do is decrease the total burden of dopaminergic drugs, again, knowing that you may worsen some of the other symptoms like freezing and tremor. You can try adding amantadine, but be very careful because, as I already mentioned, amantadine can cause cognitive impairment, and you're dealing with a population that's at high risk of cognitive impairment. And if your patient is already cognitively impaired, forget the amantadine. Peak dose dyskinesias occur predictably when you're taking the medication. You know, half an hour after they take their levodopa, they're sitting there flailing away. It lasts 45 minutes, and it gets better, for example. So there, what you're going to want to do is give them smaller doses of medication spread out more closely to avoid peaks and valleys.
But when you're treating motor fluctuations, especially when patients complain of wearing off and freezing, you have to ask yourself, are these really motor fluctuations? So has somebody actually observed them being off and frozen, or are they something else? So there is the concept of non-motor fluctuations, and particularly in anxiety. So you have patients who sit there, and they tell you, I'm off, I'm off. And you move them around, and they're actually quite limber, and they don't seem to be very rigid, and you actually get them to get up and walk, and they can do it, but they just have this inner feeling of being kind of paralyzed, and you realize it's more of a cognitive paralysis. It's a type of anxiety. Um, and then there may be behavioral issues at, at play as well. So you want to make sure somebody's observed the uh, being off before. And same thing goes with tremor. I get, I get uh, every once in a while, I, I hear about a patient who's having worsening and worsening tremors, and then when you actually observe them, th those aren't the tremors, they're dyskinesias, right? So when somebody's describing a symptom, make sure you have an accurate description of the, of the symptom. And so that goes to the fact that if you have a patient who's having a lot of fluctuations and you can't get a handle on what's going on, you need to have behavioral charting. Um, you need to have, you know, uh, a couple of days of charting where somebody will, at every hour, every two hours, make a quick note of what the patient's state is like so that you can try to figure out what's going on. So uh, just for the, for the other rooms, I don't know if you, if you could hear. The, the question was how effective tricks are for freezing. So I think in a cognitively intact patient, they can be quite effective. Uh, and in fact, there's some, there's some relatively cheap products now that you can get. You can get a little attachment that clips onto the walker and projects a laser beam onto the ground. Uh, so you have a little virtual line for them to, to step over. So that, that's worked every once in a while. Uh, and they used to be you know, $10,000 things, but now it's a little clip-on thing that you can get for a couple hundred bucks. So it actually may be a worthwhile investment. Yeah. I would try it first with pieces of tape because if, it's, if it doesn't work for that patient, then you can save yourself the money. But yeah, that can be, that can be effective for sure. Yeah. And it's not a, a trick in the sense of a you know, psycho, psychosomatic thing. It's a, it's a real uh, thing about that stimulus just overcomes the, the freezing. Yeah. Any other questions about that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the question is, is there a ceiling on the amount of L-DOPA? The ceiling really to me is when they're having side effects. Uh, and so uh, you, you, patients come in and they've read this thing and they say, oh, a gram of levodopa is, is the most I should have, two grams is. And, and, but, but I've seen little old, you know, little tiny people on huge doses. And then I have some patients who, you know, more than 100 milligrams four times a day, and they're really severely dyskinetic, and they're having all sorts of side effects, and we can't push it up any further. So I think it's the, it's the side effects. But again, recognizing what the potential side effects are. So recognizing that the psychosis can be a side effect. So if they're already on, as you say, 200 milligrams six times a day, and they're starting to see little cats in their room, then that's, you fit the ceiling there. Yeah. Is there a question at the back? Yeah, so a good question about, you know, the, the, the subtleties of, of uh, levodopa prescribing. So the question was with re respect to in, in immediate release and controlled release levodopa. Um, the dogma among neurologists is CR is most of the time a waste of time because it's not really controlled release. It doesn't give you a nice, smooth release. It's kind of controlled release like this. Uh, and so most neurologists will use CR uh, at night to try to avoid having to give a wake-up dose because it might work in that setting where the patient is a little less active. That being said, I have seen patients who they're wearing off on IR. We don't want to try any of the other strategies we, we do, and we change them to CR, and it works. So I'm not very dogmatic about it, but I, but I wouldn't start a patient on CR right off the bat. Um, sometimes when you're running into wearing off, you can use the controlled release. And that combined uh, 
uh, approach is sometimes used if patients have a delayed on with the controlled release. So they'll give them a bit of immediate release to get them going, and then they try to use the controlled release to, to, to keep it going as well. And there's another product you, you see. It's, it's heavily marketed in the States to, to patients, and I still get patients somehow who, who come and they've you know, read ads in, in, the, in the American magazines. There's a product called Riteri, which is basically an extended a CR in kind of a non-crushable, and it's supposed to be a little bit more smooth. And I don't think it's any different than regular CR, really, honestly. So if you're going to use CR, you can just use the good old CR. You don't have to pay five dollars a pill for it. Any other questions before we go? So, so moving on to some of the neuropsychiatric symptoms. What are, so so people have already mentioned hallucinations, right? Um, what are some of the other psychiatric manifestations of Parkinson's disease that are challenging in residential care? Obsessive, Obsessive behaviors, yeah, obsessions. And you mentioned impulse control early on, which fits in with that, yeah. Any other psychiatric problems? Anxiety, Anxiety. yeah, big one. Paranoia. 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 Nightmares. Compulsive behaviors, yeah. I think the other major category we're kind of missing is depression as well. It happens quite often. Right? So, and then cognitive impairment. <laughs> so starting with cognitive impairment, there's two patterns of cognitive impairment that you'll see in Parkinson's disease. There's what's called the subcortical cognitive impairment, which refers to subcortical structures, meaning the, the, the basal ganglia. And so that is slow thought processing, you know, the patients are taking a long time to get to your answers. Uh, their memory is pretty good, but they have trouble with concentration. They have trouble uh, with complex um, uh, executive tasks like, you know, writing a check or uh, remembering to call their son on Sunday or something like that. Um, the, other, the, the pathophysiology of the subcortical cognitive impairment may be the same as the motor symptoms. So disruption of um, cells that were projecting from the brainstem to the basal ganglia, and as those cells become damaged, um, not only does it cause the motor symptoms, but it causes the subcortical cognitive symptoms. And the reason it's important to understand that pathophysiology is that the, the subcortical cognitive symptoms may fluctuate with the motor function, and they may respond to the motor function. So, so you, you actually, they, they've done studies where they look at patients who are off and on, and their, their cognitive scores are worse when they, if they're tested on an off state than an on state, particularly if they have this subcortical pattern. And that is not just reaction time and things like that. It's really um, the, the, the cognitive function. The other pattern is the cortical pattern, where you have prominent visual spatial and memory dysfunctions, in, in many respects similar to what you see in Alzheimer's disease, but often with more prominent visual spatial difficulties. You know, they bump into things. They, these are the patients who score 28 on the MMSC, but the one place they really bomb is the, is the intersecting pentagons. They can't do that at all, or they give you a really weird clock. Um, the cortical cognitive symptoms are due to those Lewy bodies being in the cortex in those later stages that I showed you of, of the pathological development of this. So uh, they're often more associated with psychosis. So the patients who are showing memory and visual spatial problems are the ones who are more likely to develop hallucinations and paranoia. And they're also often don't fluctuate in the same way that the, the subcortical cognitive symptoms do. So, and again, many patients have both or they, they have some overlap between this. So when you have cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease, um, your first step is to re reduce their anticholinergic burden, and that includes both medication that's used for treating their Parkinson's symptoms, but also uh, other anticholinergic medications. And I, I, I hope that to this audience, you are well-versed in the idea that you know, we, anticholinergic burden is a, is a, is a major effect on uh, cognitive function. Um, and then prescribing cholinesterase inhibitors. And I, and I realize that prescribing cholinesterase inhibitors in uh, a residential care setting might be a bit of a, of a controversial notion, but I'll, I'll highlight a couple of scenarios where it actually can be quite useful. The other thing to know is that cognitive impairment can be worsened by orthostatic hypoperfusion as well. So if you have patients who have very severe orthostatic hypotension, even if they're not symptomatic from the dizziness perspective, it may be worsening their cognitive impairment. So sometimes it's worth... Uh, treating the orthostatic hypotension. 
particularly if you can do simple things like removing antihypertensives and pushing fluids um, you know, to, to treat them. Treatment of psychosis. So if psychosis is very sudden in onset, then obviously look for delirium. Right? Don't, uh, don't automatically assume this is Parkinson's disease if the patient never had hallucinations and all of a sudden they're having florid, distressing hallucinations. Um, but if you've ruled out delirium, then again, um, you know, the same approaches that would go to treating psychosis and Alzheimer's disease apply to Parkinson's disease. So look for triggers and look for modifiable uh, uh, triggers that are, that are causing this. So this is, again, where your behavioral charting becomes very important. And then ask yourself if the symptoms really need to be treated. So sometimes patients have relatively mild hallucinations that are not bothering them. Uh, I had one uh, patient when I uh, was doing my fellowship who was in residential care, and they would see a lovely play outside their room every night, and they could describe it in exquisite detail and all the actors that were there, but it was actually an enjoyable thing to them. And we decided that, you know, the benefits of, or the risks of treating this person with antipsychotics really wasn't worth it when they would just sit there nicely and watch the play and wasn't bothering anybody, so we let it slide. Um, my, my fellowship supervisor had a video of another man who would see, um, you know, the, the, the Montreal Canadiens and the Toronto Maple Leafs playing a game outside uh, on, on the roof of the building, and, you know, it was entertaining. Um, but if the symptoms are bothersome or if they're causing the patient to react in some way, then you'll, you'll want to treat them. Again, as I mentioned early on, this is where the dopaminergic medication can really be a, a, a trigger. And so the first thing you want to do is reduce dopaminergic medication as tolerated. Um, and then, sorry, my slides are a little funny with their, how things are appearing. This is where uh, a trial of a cholinesterase inhibitor can be worthwhile. I've had um, a number of patients with Parkinson's disease and mild psychosis, but psychosis that needed to be treated, you know, distressing hallucinations, a little bit of paranoia, et cetera, where we can spare them the antipsychotic medication just by giving them uh, denepazil or rivastigmine or something like this. So, so this is where it can be helpful. I'll tell you honestly, the randomized controlled trial evidence for this is weak. Uh, it's actually only been studied in Alzheimer's disease. It hasn't been formally studied in Parkinson's disease, and the, and the, and the studies in Alzheimer's disease are all over the place. Um, but I have enough anecdotal evidence to say that I think it, I think it works. Uh, and if there's an indication from a, from a cognitive perspective, again, you know, a patient who's got dementia and has got a, a low MMSE score, starting to have hallucinations, I'll, I'll reach for the denepazil before I, I go and reach the three antipsychotics. Yeah. For psychosis or for cognition? No, for, for, for dementia, yeah. Yeah, so, so absolutely. The, there, there is robust evidence for treating the cognitive dysfunction. So that's why I'm saying you can kill two birds with one stone. If they've got psychosis and they've got dementia, I think it's really worth doing it. And, and so that, this is one of the cases where, I, where you know, people say, well, they're already in residential care. Do we want to expose them to the risks of the cholinesterase inhibitors? The risks of the other drugs we're going to use to, to, to treat the psychosis are, are probably worse than the risks of trying a cholinesterase inhibitor in this, in this stint. Memantine, I'd be a little bit more on the fence with. <laughs> I, I, I haven't necessarily seen memantine as being successful for treating the psychosis. Memantine can treat the cognitive symptoms, and sometimes that's a you know, discussion you want to have with the patient, whether they really want to give that a try. But you have to be aware that memantine also can cause paradoxical reactions. So I've seen patients on memantine who develop psychosis on the memantine. Um, and so just, just be a little bit more cautious with memantine than you would be with the cholinesterase inhibitor. If you are reaching for the antipsychotics, remember that antipsychotics have at their core uh, causing extrapyramidal symptoms, and extrapyramidal symptoms are a core feature of Parkinson's disease, so you will, you will make your Parkinson's symptoms worse on an on a antipsychotic. Quetiapine may be the safest and easiest to use. The evidence is very mixed, but for Parkinson patient with psychosis, it's generally used as a first-line therapy. There is the best evidence for clozapine, uh, but the problem with clozapine, as many of you know, is that it requires frequent blood monitoring, and so lots of people shy away from it. 
Although, again, in residential care, uh, if you're in a facility where they do weekly blood draws, it, it, it actually is reasonably easy to, to, to arrange for that we weekly blood draw. And really, that's where the evidence is best. Clozapine does have some anticholinergic properties to it as well, though, so you can make the confusion a little bit worse. So, you know, you're always weighing risks and benefits here. So I reach for the antipsychotics when the psychosis is, doesn't respond to a cholinesterase inhibitor or the patient couldn't tolerate it, and when there's a real need to, to treat the, the psychosis. And again, when you've tried to eliminate all the other offending drugs first before reaching for the antipsychotic. There's evidence that olanzapine, risperidone, and aripiprazole do not work, and they make things worse. So there's, there's really no indication for risperidone in a patient with um, Parkinson's disease most of the time. Okay. Anxiety. Um, so episodic anxiety may or may not be directly due to motor fluctuation. So this is where behavioral charting um, can be very helpful again. If you see that every time the patient is off, they're also very anxious, then pumping them full of benzodiazepine isn't, isn't, isn't addressing the problem. So, so you need to be aware that, okay, the anxiety is being triggered by the off, and whereas previously I was going to maybe let that off state slide a little bit because I was worried about changing around their dopaminergic medication, now not only are they off, they're very anxious, they're causing a ruckus because of how awful they feel, so we're going to try to, to treat it at this point. Um, so again, behavioral charting, and you want to know, does the mood fluctuate in response to the motor symptoms? Chronic, pervasive anxiety, very common in Parkinson's disease, probably a, a prevalence of 40% in this condition. And it's less ruminative and more paralytic. By that I mean the, these patients aren't up all night worried about, oh, my son, you know, they're not getting into university and, and all these things that people have generalized anxiety disorder. They, they say, I don't know what I'm anxious about. I just feel tense. I feel anxious. I feel paralyzed. And it's, it's, it's often a very distressing symptom to, to people. Um, and it's hard to treat. Um, but if you can ascertain that they're not just anxious, but they're depressed, then this is where trying an antidepressant and SSRI medication might be helpful. Um, if there's concomitant dementia, many of you will be aware of recent studies showing that SSRIs may not really do much for depression and dementia. So they're, they're hard symptoms to treat, but I think it's worth doing because it's often so distressing to the patients. But again, you want to follow up on your prescription and see whether it's had an effect before you keep going. If you're going to use benzodiazepines, then use them very judiciously, reassess frequently. Um, again, I hope I'm kind of preaching to the choir here when you know about the risks of benzodiazepines with respect to falls and, and confusion. But again, you're weighing the risks and benefits. If patients have paralyzing, debilitating anxiety, uh, then sometimes a little bit of regular clonazepam will be enough to break the anxiety without causing more confusion, without causing more fails, uh, falls. So you just need to, to be very careful if you're going to try those. Apathy is sometimes uh, distinct from anxiety, and that's really the lack of initiative. And I think this may be somewhat less of a problem in residential care. When patients are still at home, it is a huge problem. You know, spouses come here and they say, I don't know what's wrong. You know, he sits there on the couch watching TV, and the TV's not even on for three hours, right? And, and when you ask the patient, are you depressed? No. Uh, they just don't have an initiative. They don't have a drive to engage in goal-directed activity. But again, if you see apathy or if families complain of apathy, normally the patient doesn't complain of it as much as, as, as family around them. Um, just ensure that there's no comorbid uh, depression. Sometimes increasing the dopaminergic medication may help. And stimulants can be tried, and you'll see patients who come in sometimes on methylphenidate or on modafinil. Again, the evidence is very mixed with them. Uh, methylphenidate has potential side effects that you tr tend to be wary of in the elderly in terms of hypertension, things like that. Modafinil has far fewer side effects, but it's very expensive. But if you have a patient who can afford it and wants to give it a try, it's, it's relatively safe. Again, the trials that I've looked at it in Parkinson haven't been very impressive. So I'm, I'm personally not a huge fan of it, but it is out there, just so you know. Um, I don't know why that came back. Sorry about that. Oh, because I'm pushing the wrong way. There we go. Insomnia. Um, insomnia kind of fits into this whole thing of the, the neuropsychiatric symptoms. So review sleep hygiene patterns with your patients. Are they drinking coffee at the wrong time, et cetera? Um, often insomnia may be due to nighttime motor symptoms. Okay? The patients wake up and they're cold and they can't even really adjust the bed sheets properly. They feel achy all over. They can't roll over in bed. 
So like my colleague who asked about controlled release levodopa, this might be a good place to give them a dose of controlled release uh, levodopa to tide them over overnight. Uh, and sometimes prescribing levodopa at an interval during the night where the patient will actually get woken up to take their medication may paradoxically improve their insomnia, right? If, if you give them a 3 a.m. dose and they go from waking up five times a night to waking up twice a night, then it actually may be worth to give them that 3 a.m. dose. So just think of that as a as thing. Urinary symptoms very common, and they may be a, a cause for insomnia, so address urinary issues if they're, if they're addressable. Um, melatonin is used very commonly, probably because it's fairly safe. Again, the evidence is pretty mixed on melatonin. There's some, there's some reasonable small trials looking at doxepin, um, which is an old tri tricyclic uh, antidepressant, uh, but that seems to cause a lot of sedation even at low doses. There's a three milligram capsule available, and that sometimes that's sufficient. Uh, but again, because it's an anti uh, tricyclic, it can have anti uh, anticholinergic side effects, so be careful if there's cognitive impairment. Zopiclone and trazodone are frequently used in, in Parkinson's disease, again, without any specific evidence for Parkinson's disease, but just because they're, they're popular sedatives in the, in the um, uh, geriatric population. REM behavior disorder. So remember, this is the patient who's thrashing around in their bedtime, punching a hole through the wall. Um, often may not need treatment unless if they are punching a hole through the wall and they're injuring themselves, then it may need it. First thing to know is that it, REM behavior disorder is often associated with antidepressant medications, SSRIs and tricyclic antidepressants. So if they're on one of these medications, the indication for it is no longer very clear, then the first step would be to take them off it because that might actually reduce the symptoms enough by itself. Uh, if not, again, here at melatonin, there is some evidence that it could be helpful. So this would be a great place to really use melatonin right away. Uh, and then clonazepam actually has quite a lot of strong evidence for it, but often you need to reach the 2 milligram, 3 milligram QHS dose, which is where you really worry about if they get up in the middle of the night, they'll be uh, quite uh, drowsy and fall and break their hips. So you have to be very careful with the clonazepam. But again, sometimes if you have a patient who has very severe RBD, this may be worthwhile trying. Okay, I'm going to skip this very quickly because we're running out of time here. <laughs> Um, orthostatic hypotension we talked about uh, quickly. Uh, this can be worsened by dopaminergic medication, so it is a symptom of Parkinson's disease, but levodopa will worsen it rather than improve it. So again, this is where you would consider a slow monitored reduction in dopaminergic burden if the patient is having symptomatic orthostatic hypotension. Um, first thing is eliminate antihypertensives. I hope, I hope now more and more people who are in residential care are really kind of passionate about what they're doing and they're doing good medication reviews. And so when you see the patient coming in with a BP of 100 over 60 and they're on amlodipine and ramipril, you kind of start weaning them off these things. Um, so that would be a first thing. Increase their salt and water intake. Uh, domperidone is not traditionally used to treat orthostatic hypotension outside of the Parkinson disease setting, but it will antagonize the peripheral action of the dopaminergic drug. So in, in, in Parkinson disease, it can be quite a useful medication. There is a warning about QT prolongation with domperidone, so watch the cardiogram. Um, that, that happens typically in doses above 40 milligrams a day, so normally I kind of go at a dose of 10 milligrams TID with a domperidone. If there's concomitant constipation, um, Canadian guidelines actually recommend to consider physostigmine or pyridostigmine. I'll have to, I have to say very honestly, I've never used either of those, but it is out there. So for what it's worth, you can consider that. Um, I have used mitodrine and fludrocortisone, and many of you are familiar with both those drugs, and, and the problem with them is they cause quite significant supine hypertension. But sometimes if it's between a patient who's going to black out every time they stand up, then you're going to have to tolerate that supine hypertension that you get. Um, my own gut instinct is that the mitodrine seems to be a little bit more effective than the fludrocortisone. So when the patient has failed domperidone and failed all the other um, things I mentioned above, I, I generally reach for the mitodrine before the fludrocortisone. Constipation, as I mentioned, predates the condition, but is often very severe. So hydrate them, make sure they're up and, and walking. Um, make sure the patients are getting as, as much fiber, prune juice, those kinds of things. Uh, polyethylene glycol can be helpful. Here again, domperidone, because it antagonizes the peripheral action of do the dopamine, can be very helpful. Uh, and um, again, guidelines have recommended physostigmine, but I don't um, personally have any experience with it. Um, urinary symptoms, 
as I mentioned, common thing that'll keep people up at night. So use, look for the typical causes first, such as prosthetic hypertrophy in men. Again, this might be aggravated by dopaminergic medication. Um, the mainstay used to be anticholinergic medications, but these worsen cognition. So Mirabagron is increasingly used, and it's one of the few kind of uh, medications that gets hyped up, but that I think has kind of lived to the hype because it tends, my experience with it is it doesn't really cause a lot of cognitive side effects. So the patients who are going to respond to one of these antispasmodics, uh, they might respond to Mirabagron, and then you get away with not causing, uh, worsening their confusion with it. And finally, drooling, sialuria, um, sometimes very distressing to patients. Some patients will respond to just gum chewing TID, 10 minutes. <laughs> so it's a pretty simple thing to do. Uh, it may resolve with increasing dopaminergic therapy, so it may be a symptom of them being too off or too, uh, uh, too rigid. Um, you can sometimes consider sublingual atropine drops, just uh, the, the ophthalmic drops. You just give them one drop under the tongue, sometimes just one at the beginning of the day or, or sometimes repeated once or twice during the day is sufficient. Again, there can be systemic effects, so it can cause some anticholinergic effects. We just admitted someone with glycopyrrolate drops. Do you use that as yeah, well? Yeah, glycopyrrolate has also? been used as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in very, very severe cases, botulinum toxin can be used. I, I don't personally do Botox, but some of the physiatrists and, and I think Jim Scott in town will do it. Um, those are going to be more rare, the patients who, who need that, but every once in a while you have a patient who's got severe sialuria. And the last symptom I want to address is pain. So pain is very common, as mentioned earlier on. So your question is, what's the cause of the pain? Is it related to freezing? Is it related to wearing off? Is it related to dystonia? So that here again, a careful symptom charting is necessary. Because if it's related to freezing, it probably will respond better to levodopa rather than tramicet. Um, so, so have an idea. Of it. But sometimes patients with Parkinson disease get these vague, very uncomfortable dysesthesias that are hard to describe. They, they certainly don't describe them like they do typical nociceptive uh, pain, but it's not described like typical neuropathic pain. They don't use burning or, or stabbing or thing. They just say it's an ache. It's, uh, I've heard a patient say it's a constant motor that's churning up my pelvis. I, there's all sorts of these, these kind of descriptions of this vague achiness that's very distressing. Um, so when they have this central neuropathic pain, then the only thing we can try is the agents that we use against neuropathic pain, like pregabalin, gabapentin, antidepressants, et cetera. We don't have great treatments for it, but it's certainly worth trying it and addressing it. Um, and if they get a clear headache, that, that's the headache over the shoulders and, and neck, then that can be caused by orthostatic hypotension. So just remember that. Okay. So I think I've reached the end. Um, I'll maybe take one minute. Um, I put this in for those people who are going to look uh, get the slide somewhere. And I've been asked if I can share the slide. So if there's a way to do that, we can, we can do that. Um, and I want to put a plug for this. This is the Physician Guide to Non-Motor Symptoms of Parkinson's Disease. Uh, it's available on this website, www.parkinsonclinicalguidelines.ca, which also has all the clinical guidelines for everything. This guide is uh, aimed at general practitioners, so it's not very dense. It's full of practical little tips. It's really great. At the back of the guide, you'll see a questionnaire where you can uh, ask about all the different symptoms that people have. So you may actually give that questionnaire to a family member to fill out with the patient at some point and give back to you, and then you could say, oh, I didn't realize that constipation was a major problem or that uh, orthostatic dizziness was a major problem that you were having or that you were seeing cats in your bedroom at night. <laughs> and so this can be a, a good way to start the conversation and to systematically address these, these symptoms um, because I'm sure they're not going to be all foremost at the back of your mind at all times. I use, I, I use that book. It's awesome. It's very easy to read. Let me just check with the off-sites. When people talk without using their mics, can you hear them? So, Duncan, can you wave if you can hear them? No, we've got no, can't hear them. Okay. No. And uh, the other site, the overflow room, can you hear them at all? Head shaking. Okay. So what I need you to do when you want to have a question, there's these little mics in front of you, and there's a button that says push. So go ahead and raise your hand, and then push the button, and you'll have to suffer the indignity of the camera zooming in on you. But it's your moment to shine. You can sing a song. You can ask a question. And then when you're done, 
push it and then the camera will zoom away from you. But that allows everyone to hear your brilliant comment. And we do want to hear the brilliant comment. So anyone willing to practice yeah. with uh, their question and their button pushing? That's going to practice. Yeah, okay. Alec, I wanted to ask you if you can comment on uh, the new topical legislation in CBD oil. Is there a place in treatment for Parkinson's for anxiety, sleep disorders, pain? Um, or any, any things we need to be aware of? I just read a fairly comprehensive review of cannabinoids in neurological disease, and there was not um, any evidence one way or another for Parkinson's disease. So the real answer is we don't know. Um, there's a lot of people who have an interest in cannabinoids for treating pain, and my personal view is if we're, patients have bad enough pain that we're resorting to things like narcotics, um, then, you know, it's probably worth giving it a try. I really advise patients against anything that has THC in it because we know that many of these patients are just on the threshold of psychosis. I don't know enough about it, but I, I, for everything I've read, CBD is not something that predisposes to psychosis. And there's lots of anecdotal evidence out there that it may help with pain. So I, I certainly don't object to pa patients who use it for treating pain. I do object to the patients who read the one study in Israel that, that CBD is going to cure the Parkinson's disease and, you know, that kind of stuff. I think you have to um, reason with people a little bit. Question from off-site, question from the overflow room, question from in here. Last chance, last chance. Think of that crazy Parkinson's patient you have back in your facility. Be like, oh, <laughs> she's crazy. <laughs> okay, you'll have to ask him afterwards. I'd like you to take a break and then come back at quarter after, so you get seven minutes. Thanks. And thanks. Thanks to you. Thank you.